So next we have uh, Attorney General Emeritus, Professor Gidu Mwegai. Who is also an old boy of the school? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman and members. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have very few words because you have directed me to the specific issues that you would like me to pronounce myself on. And uh, subject to any further directions, I want to go straight to that agenda. Oh, please do. Uh, the first question that you put to me rela uh, relates to uh, the question of restructuring IEBC and the audit of the 2022 elections. First, I would like to state that uh, it's been my very unfortunate duty to be involved in the reconstitution of IEBC uh, previously, a process that was uh, uh, very, very uh, difficult for all the parties involved. I remember that uh, we disbanded the entire IEBC, uh, sent them home, and and we started afresh. Um, I would personally be against uh, institutionalizing that kind of thing. Uh, I, I do not support creating a permanent state of inability, instability in institutions. For example, we have reconstituted the judiciary twice. And uh, I think that some good gains were made by that process, but I think that that process created some inherent instability in the institution itself. But I'm not here to talk about the judiciary. I'm about to talk, I'm here to talk about IEBC. We have tried several methods of constituting IEBC. When, Mr. Chairman, you recall, we came out of the crisis of, of, uh, of the 80s and we had IPPG. Uh, it was thought that what we should do is to allow political parties to nominate individual members uh, into the IEBC. It was uh, an unmitigated disaster. It was an unmitigated disaster. And I don't think we should be tempted again to allow party participation in the appointment of commissioners. I believe myself that we need an independent, robust uh, process of recruitment. At the present, uh, I am not very sure that the system in place is giving us our best first 11. Now, how can we strengthen it? Um, I think that, for example, when they say the Law Society of Kenya, my own professional body, is to, is to send a representative um, I am not very sure that uh, that necessarily creates autonomy. Or when they say religious leaders will have a representative, or trade union leaders, and so on and so forth. I, I think we need to find a way of forming that constitutive body that will interview those who qualify for these positions. I agree with those who say that there is no legal reason why the chairman should be a lawyer uh, because the election is, not, is, is more than a legal process. It's a management process. And what we want to do is uh, be able to uh, elect into the commission good managers, strong managers, proven managers 
who then can hire the best lawyers that uh, they, they can either within the Secretariat itself or uh, from outside the Secretariat, hopefully whom they can be able uh, to pay. Number two, should we go back to uh, uh, ask ourselves what happened in the 2022 election? My own honest opinion is that it is not a useful exercise. Why is it not useful? Because again, it reopens the question that has been resolved with finality by the Supreme Court. The challenge with reopening matters that have been judicially settled is that you, by, by necessary implication and inadvertently, you create the possibility that confidence in that institution can be eroded. And I don't think that that would give us, uh, in going forward, it would create a permanent state of uh, in, uh, electoral instability. Because no matter who would win or lose, no matter what the Supreme Court would say, that party would say, we know. In fact, in that year, the Supreme Court said this, but when we did a further a forensic audit, the forensic audit produced uh, a different outcome. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the work of the Supreme Court, the work of the Supreme Court is not to declare that the election was conducted without a hitch. That is not the standard. It is not to find whether there was any hitch. In fact, since I started participating in these elections in 2013, before the Supreme Court, 10 years ago, the Supreme Court has always said there was a hitch. There was a hitch. But the standard of the law is, was there a hitch of such a substantial nature that it affected the outcome of the election. And in, in four of the cases I participated in, the answer was no. In one, the Supreme Court said, yes, this, this is not good. This, this is not a hitch. This has gone beyond a hitch. Uh, I didn't agree with them then, but I respected that opinion and I obeyed it. Uh, and as the attorney of the Republic, I went back and started arranging for a new election, which we did hold thereafter. One of the problems we have, ladies and gentlemen, in these constitutional timelines that are locked up in the Constitution, uh, it confirms what the philosopher said, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. When we wrote the Constitution here in Bomas, we thought that putting timelines in which the court, by which the court must determine the dispute, we were making sure that the country would be stable, that a transition would be done quickly. We were wrong. It now turns out, in my experience, that this time is not enough. And this method that we use, this method that is by documents only, by affidavits only, and so on, is not enough. So that's one thing that if we were to reopen that process, that is one area that the experts would prob uh, probably need to look at, the timelines. Uh, in fact, we almost ran into a constitutional crisis in 2017. Uh, we, we dodged a, a bullet by the, by, by the sheer love of God because we, Parliament had broken up, had prorogued, Parliament had gone home, it couldn't make more law, it couldn't make law to guide us. And the judges had found the night before the election that uh, election officers had been wrongly uh, wrongly appointed. It took the Court of Appeal sitting at night to deal with that technical problem. Where the life of the nation is concerned, we don't want those near hits. Uh, we then went into uh, uh, an election 
where I think uh, had we missed the timeline, there would have been no government. And that's, that's the constitution we have. If the, con if the election is not, for example, if we do an election, the Electoral Commission declares a presidential winner, a petition is filed, uh, members of the Supreme Court are kidnapped, we do not hear the, the, the petition and finalize it within the period provided, then we have no government. I think these are very dangerous propositions and we want to have a more flexible, a more flexible system. And I, I, know, I know there are many experts who can help us deal with that. So I, 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 that's all I wish to say about IEBC, about re reopening the question. About boundaries delimitation, I want to start by saying that my own personal view, which is not a view shared by many of my countrymen, is that we have too many people in parliament. We have too many constituencies, uh, so that we should be reducing constituencies, not increasing. Uh, we have too many counties. We should reduce counties, not increase counties. Uh, they are costing us a lot of money, and quite a number of them are not viable. When we were in Bomas, the constitution we gave you, ladies and gentlemen of, of the Honorable August House of Parliament, uh, I think we had given you nine counties. Fourteen? I'm, 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 I'm corrected, fourteen. It was when the politicians went to Naivasha that they, they came to this compromise of let's go to 41. I think if we are to reopen this constitution, one of the issues we can usefully reopen is the reduction of counties bring more counties together and let them work together and the, uh, mobilize resources together and share uh, work, uh, together. Uh, so I'm not a great fan of increasing uh, counties or indeed of increasing uh, constituencies. And this may bring me then to another issue which I was supposed to take later. This issue of the gender rule, we call it the gender rule, but essentially, really, it is the women empowerment rule. Uh, I struggled with it when I was the attorney of the Republic, and it, it, we, came, we came to grief. For as many bills as we worked on, we came to grief. And I want to be very, very honest with you. First, there is a feeling among many Kenyans and that we have not done enough to justify uh, this. Uh, our social education around, the, around this uh, has not been successful and we need to do some, some more civic education around why empowering women has the effect of empowering the uh, whole community in the long run, or well, let's say in the medium term. What would be my solution about this? Of all the ones we have tried, I think only one can succeed, and that is to, to abolish the woman, the woman seat, to abolish the seat of the woman representative completely, and then to create two seats in every constituency, one for a woman and one for a man. In fact, we end up with 50% being women. We improve, we do better than the 30% that we already have. And that one is neat. Uh, it is achievable without much mathematics, arithmetics, uh, and it is straightforward. Uh, that, that, that would be my, my proposal. There is an issue you put to me, honorable members, that is... Very sorry, Prof, important. sorry. You said 290 times 2. Yes. That's, that's how many? 580? Oh, you know my... 
my original proposal is that we reduce the constituencies. So we would first reduce the constituencies, then have, yeah, to about 100 constituencies, then have one man, one woman in each of those 100 constituencies. Give us 200. Yes. Yes. And the office and status of a member of parliament will be restored. There is one issue, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, you asked me to talk about, and that is the issue of social economic rights, which is the issue of the cost of living. This is a chicken and egg problem that uh, is, in my view, very, very hard to uh, we need the economy to function at a certain level in order to produce goods and services that allow us to distribute. It is the legendary Tom Boyer in the ideological debates of the 60s that he held with uh, uh, senior Jeramogu Ginga Odinga. Uh, and, 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 and the grand old man, Jeramogu, was talking about distributing wealth. And Tom Boyer kept reminding him, we need to create the wealth first. That problem is alive today as it was in the 1960s. We need to create wealth in order to distribute it. And therefore, socioeconomic rights are economic rights. Socioeconomic rights are important fundamental rights in the Constitution. But we need to fund them. In order to respect them, we need to be able to fund them. So we need the economy to grow. We are in a chicken and egg position. We need the economy to grow in order for us to fund socioeconomic rights. The economy is not growing, therefore we are not funding. So that is the problem. That is the problem. Because no matter which government is, is in control, uh, our envelope our financial envelope is the same. And as long as that envelope is not growing, we will not be able. We will not be able to give free meals in schools, which, as many of you know, that would be a big game changer because our students sometimes perform very poorly because they haven't eaten. They just haven't had a good meal. They can't stay awake in the class uh, and so on. So if we could fund that, it would be a huge game changer. To fund it is a huge budgetary item. And I could go to many, many, many other uh, uh, important uh, socioeconomic concerns. So my, my suggestion is that we need to progressively enforce socioeconomic rights, progressively, and in the communities that deserve them the most. Uh, we used to say that the majesty of French law is that it treats the king in his castle the same way it treats the beggar in the street. Uh, that cannot be a very good law, can it? We cannot treat everybody equally because not everybody is in the same circumstances. When we enforce social, uh, socioeconomic laws, we must start with the most vulnerable so that the most vulnerable are attended to first, with the most basic needs, so that they can live a, a minimum dignity uh, that is, is, is accorded uh, to them. Now, let me say something about, I've talked about the two-third. Well, this issue of defecting from political parties, this also is as old as our, as our, uh, our history, honorable members. In fact, the first thing that happened uh, after independence, on the anniversary of, of, of uh, independence and on the birth of the republic, is that people crossed floors. Kadu, Kadu crossed the floor. Kadu was the opposition. It crossed the floor. I think the last man who was left screaming and kicking was Joseph Martin Shikuku. 
And I remember th at that time, from the reading I have done, there wasn't a lot of noise about the democratic character of crossing the floor. But in 66, when, K uh, when KPU uh, uh, was formed and KPU crossed the floor, the very erudite uh, Joseph Thomas Moyer was very, very, very critical. I was saying to cross the floor is to lose the mandate of the party that elected you. Now, and I have a, I, I have a sympathy. Yes, please. I have sympathy for that. I think that uh, we should have in law mechanisms of containing uh, persons to the parties uh, 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 in, uh, to the parties on whose platform they were elected. So that's my opinion on that. Now, let, what is the last issue? It's not clear, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Just uh, make it clear. What is your position on that? My position is uh, that uh, if I presented myself to the people of Kamukunji as a member of the Kenya African National Union and I was elected as such, I should be obligated if I am to continue for the five years to retain fidelity to that party, the party on whose platform I was elected. If I crossed the floor and became, uh, in fact, and voted with and became associated with the Kenya African Democratic Union, then I should vacate my seat and a by-election should be held. That's my opinion. It is not a popular opinion, I know, among uh, politicians. However, uh, you told me to come and talk about my opinion. <laughs> Let me now tell you an even more unpopular, let me give you a more unpopular view, and it is my last one. I do not believe, I do not believe as a constitutional lawyer and historian that there is any justification for any fund. There is no justification for the constituency development fund there is no justification for affirmative action fund, and there is no justification for Senate or for line fund. We have one government at two levels. We have a national government. The fund of the national government is in the treasury. It is kept by the national cabinet secretary to the treasury. The second fund, is the governor, <laughs> is in the county. It is kept by the governor. Any other fund, any other fund has no place in our constitutional architecture. There should be only money in two levels, the national level and, 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 and uh, at uh, the county level. Let me tell you why I have another difficulty with this. I have another difficulty with our members of parliament, our honorable members of parliament, becoming both the appropriators of fund, debating the budget, appropriating cash, then following it, following the cash themselves, <laughs> yes, and Spending the cash, I think it blurs the roles because the work of parliament is to tax and to spend, then to oversight, right? So I, I don't feel very comfortable when the member of parliament has fought very hard for money to go to Kiambu County then before it arrives, it finds him sitting in the constituency. <laughs> and, and he, so that is a, a personal view, but one that I hold very strongly. 
I, I, I would like to see my senator and my, and my member of parliament oversighting calling, uh, and I, I, I have seen the Senate, for example, uh, is very, very, very robust on this role. And I, 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 I think that's the correct role. It says to the governor, this is the report we have received. Tell us how you spent this money. If the senator was down there himself spending some money, I think the ability to ask Another spender, how he spent, <laughs> might be compromised. Uh, so, unfortunately, I don't support that. Now, finally, do I oppose the setting up of the office of leader of the official opposition? No, I don't oppose at all. Actually, I think it, I think it makes politics neater. It makes politics neater. It keeps this general closer to his troops, or to her troops for that matter. Uh, uh, the truth is, in a democracy, the opposition is a government in waiting. And therefore, in fact, the opposition has shadow cabinet ministers. So they should be operating in parliament, uh, shadowing, shadowing the other cabinets uh, minister, asking them questions that are informed and that help to show that this party, at the le next election, they are ready. They are, they are ready to be the government. They are responsible, they are organized, and that is their general there, the leader of the official opposition. And he is accorded all due. In a democracy, the leader of the opposition actually has such high level of security clearance that he is briefed. He is briefed the same way the president is briefed. If there are national security questions, he is briefed. If there are internal threats, external threats, he is briefed. Uh, if there are visiting delegations and so on, uh, the, the, the leader of the opposition is, 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 is briefed. So that, uh, and that is why in a democracy we call it the royal opposition, the loyal opposition. The opposition is not a, gov a hostile, it's not a hostile group of people. It is part and parcel of government. It is loyal. It is, the opposition is loyal to the government of the day. Because and after the next election, chances are that the opposition will be the government and the government will be the opposition. That's the way it should work. Finally, the prime cabinet secretary, I have no problem with that. Uh, I think it is a way of organizing cabinet uh, to make it more efficient, to make it more, I found But the committee systems are very difficult to organize if there isn't somebody who is chairing them, bringing them together, and, and, and supervising them. The president cannot do that. He's very busy. The vice president is very busy deputizing. And by default, uh, I did find uh, 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 at one point when we had a very, very heavy legislative agenda immediately after the new constitution, I found myself playing that role, bringing people to the state law office and organizing ab uh, around the legislation that we had. So I would have no difficulty with that at all. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I sp spoke for too long. Uh, Your, Your Excellency, Honorable Dr. Calonzo, you are not here before, so I would like to acknowledge you. And that's my presentation. Thank Can you I... very much, uh, <coughs> Professor, for that very incisive engagement with uh, quite a number of unpopular <laughs> <laughs> views, with the, as you said, with the political class. Yeah. And maybe, maybe on a light note, is that how the case on NGCDF was lost in court when you were aging? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was lost in the Supreme Court after I had left. 
By the way, when I was there, and this uh, my colleagues on the left will confirm, a lawyer never argues his opinion. He argues his instructions. Uh, when the case first, that, uh, first started, my instructions from the government of the day was to support CDF, and we supported CDF. Now, today I'm speaking as a citizen. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to be the first to go, uh, Prof, and to tell you how pleased I am to see you this morning and to listen to your very candid views about issues that are confronting us as a country and which we find um, are engaging the mandate of this committee. Um, so thank you for volunteering upon and by the National Assembly and of course the chair of the Parliamentary Service Commission it happens to be the Speaker of the National Assembly. Um, so, what will be your view? I once visited Nigeria to see a friend who was a speaker.